So welcome, uh, old friends, new friends. Thanks for coming to another monthly Story Code event. Um, so we're, so we're, in case you didn't hear this, we're calling these forums now as we transition off of the Meetup platform into our very own world, our very own Story Code world. Um, if you have not been here before, our monthly events um, include this, which is usually the third Tuesday of every month. And um, we usually have case studies, which we have today, and um, often uh, project presentations, five minutes or so at the end of um, at the end of the meetup. And we encourage anyone who has projects that are either in process or are looking for feedback to contact us if they want to do end of uh, meetup presentations. And if you have suggestions for main presentations, do let us know. My name is Ina Abioden. This is Mike Knowlton, and we are the co-founders of Story Code. And um, today is exciting, especially exciting, because it is T minus four days until the big Story Code Hackathon. <laughs> I'm actually surprised to see so many of the contestants in the room today. I'm like, I thought you'd be like at home scratching your heads, trying to figure out what you're going to do. Um, but it's really exciting. Um, we, I'll, we'll just, I'll just give you a, a quick rundown on what's going to happen. So it's the 20th and the 29th, and um, we have uh, secured a number of sponsors on the brand side and on the technology side. And the challenge is these guys arrive here on Saturday morning. Um, they get their orders. Um, their orders are to create a story across three platforms in the time that they have, which is starting 11 a.m. on Saturday morning, and by 4 p.m. by I believe 3 p.m. Yeah, stop 3 p.m. They, they stop on Sunday. They will spend the night here, and they will likely sleep on the benches you are sitting on. So it's going to be fun. Um, <laughs> we expect that awesome projects are going to come out of this. Um, it's going to be three platforms of their choosing. So it could be anything. We have no idea what it'll be. Um, our brand sponsor is Free People. Our technology sponsors include Twilio, um, Kaltura, and Social Samba. So uh, shout out to and them. And LogicWorks. The, and LogicWorks. Sorry, He's sorry, sorry. Out for cloud. <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> if you're watching on the live stream. Um, <laughs> So um, we're really excited to see what's going to come out. This is one of the big goals of Story Code is to move into this space, into innovation, into incubation, experimentation. Um, we're jazzed to see our totally insanely talented community come out. And by the way, we got, I think, seven times more uh, applications for this than we could take. So if you are one of those people who did not get in, chances are you didn't have a team and Basically, we took a lot more people with teams than without. So we apologize if you couldn't get in. We will expand this as the experimentation continues. Um, for those of you who got in, you better do a good job so that people aren't <laughs> mad at you that you took their spot. <laughs> no pressure. Um, and um, with that, uh, oh, one more thing. So the presentations on Sunday are going to be juried. Um, and there's going to be a cash prize and, and some other prizes from our sponsors. Um, it will happen at 4.30 p.m. in this very room. Now, due to space constraints, we will not be able to do our usual meetup thing. Um, so uh, basically what's going to happen is that it's kind of a lottery. <laughs> um, on Thursday afternoon, we will release a certain number of seats. Um, Thursday afternoon at noon. If you are dying to come, please be by your telephone or your, your email or whatever. We'll send out an email at noon on Thursday, and you can uh, you know, put your name in for a spot. But uh, if you can't uh, get a spot, you will be able to watch it on live stream, and it will be archived. Um, everyone will have 15 minutes for their presentation. There will be judging. There will be prize giving. There will be hooping and hollering, and there may be some weeping. So <laughs> we look forward to it. Um, thanks again. I'll hand it over to Mike. Awesome. Um, thanks, Ina. So uh, this evening we've got uh, Jay Bennett from Smoke Bomb Entertainment uh, here. Really excited and, and welcome, Jay. Uh, uh, maybe six months or so, or a little while ago, I saw Totally Amped and just thought it was the coolest thing and uh, uh, wanted to bring you down here to kind of talk about it. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on Jay, uh, he's a creative director at Smoke Bomb Entertainment. Um, he's an award-winning creator, producer, and writer of original content for the web, um, television, mobile devices, and live events. He's worked on a number of transmedia projects before, including developing the creative for the international Emmy-nominated project Collapsus. A number of us are familiar with that project. So uh, we're really excited to welcome you, Jay, 
and look forward to uh, learning more about Totally Amped and the other things you're working on. Uh, yeah, I think I can do that by doing... Well, I don't even see my cursor. Oh, I have to watch it off this. This is the presentation, by the way. Uh, okay. Here we go. Uh, thank you, Mike, for having me. This is really cool uh, to come down here and talk about this project, Totally Amped. Um, so uh, my goal here is to sort of, uh, uh, in, in speaking to Mike and sort of what would be most interesting to you guys is sort of do a bit of an autopsy on this project um, and sort of go back to day one and talk about why it was conceived, why it was done, uh, what worked, and probably what's usually interesting, what didn't work, and why, and uh, um, sort of to pass on some knowledge for all of you interested in making uh, app series, and that's what Totally Amped is, is. We sort of say it's the first. There have other, other types of iterations, but I think um, for what we were trying to do, which is essentially put a TV show uh, inside of an app and then spit interactive elements and sort of things you can play with also within that app, all contained within a nice little box. Um, I think we were sort of uh, the, the first to do that. Uh, before I go too deep though, I'll just sort of uh, give you a bit of background on myself and, and who Smoke Mom is. And, and you'll sort of see, I think, um, the way I approach making projects like this and the way Smoke Mom does. And, and uh, you'll probably see that then come out as we start to dig through how we made Totally Amped. So uh, I'm the creative director at, at Smoke Bomb. Uh, before that, I was the creative director at a company called Xenophile Media in Toronto. Um, the big difference is uh, at Xenophile, that was sort of in the mid to late 2000s, and we were doing all the crazy uh, ARG stuff back then and, and um, sending people to websites and burying things and, and uh, um, solving puzzles and looking for the, the code in the URL. And uh, coming up through that experience and really where I cut my teeth moving from sort of an associate producer up to their creative director, through that really learned that f for myself and f from where I view it, I, I disagreed with that approach to sort of digital storytelling and, and transmedia storytelling to me. And I consider myself a mainstream user, someone who is not really into um, finding the, the magic rabbit hole. Uh, I wanted... Uh, more of the story and I wanted it really accessible and I wanted it presented to me um, usually through video. I think that's something we all understand and get and I think there were opportunities to go and, and drill down deeper but I always said you know if I, if I was going to spend ten dollars on a project I'd want to put eight bucks into the video portion or really the, the, the simplest uh, most consumable portion of that and then take the other two dollars and bury something and, and do some code. Um, but at Smoke Bomb, that is sort of what we're doing. Uh, and so we are, that's, that's why I like Smoke Bomb. We are now really trying to make more mainstream, accessible, uh, transmedia, convergent, digital content, whatever sort of quotation we want to put on it. Um, and part of that helps is we were acquired by Shaftesbury Films very early on. Shaftesbury is uh, one of Canada's big uh, television production companies. And so we have a, a, a two-pronged approach. One is we are to make convergent or transmedia project for all of Shaftesbury's TV shows. Um, and that is probably, at the moment, 80% of what we do. And then it is also to make original content. And I would say actually Totally Amped is probably our first uh, project that's been fully produced and launched, lots of things in development as always, but uh, uh, Totally Amped was, was the first sort of to market where it was wholly original um, from start to finish done by Smoke Bomb, of which I was the, the producer and the creative on. Um, yeah, I'm sort of, I'm following along this PowerPoint presentation myself. Uh, <laughs> so to sort of give you a sense of how we approach doing these things, um, a couple of examples of, of projects uh, we've done in the past and, and, and I've done. Um, something like The Listener, which is a primetime uh, male-female Tuesday night series in Canada on CTV. I think it was on NBC for a year here in its first season before it got uh, pulled. But um, it's about a show about a, uh, a paramedic, now a cop, who has telepathic powers. And um, what we've really found in having a lot of success uh, doing with this type of content, and by that I mean asking essentially 
40 something housewives and people who just want to come home from work and watch a TV show and getting them to go online, it's giving them more of what they love and giving them more of the characters they love and the story world they love. But obviously there's no point in just making a shorter version of the, the TV show. So what we're getting in the habit of doing is taking the story world and flipping it on its head and doing something that you could never actually see on television. So with The Listener, that's about this telepath who has powers, we did something called Switch and we're just in post on this now and it'll come out in a, a couple months. We actually gave the sidekick uh, the telepathic powers and our hero loses them. And so it's much more a comedy buddy series than this sort of serious thriller. But it's the same characters I recognize, it's the same world I recognize, but it's something totally different. Uh, another example of that is Murdoch Mysteries. That's um, sort of Sherlock Holmes meets CSI in turn of the century Toronto in, in 1900. Uh, so for season five, and this is just about to come out soon, it's called The Murdoch Effect. So we took the lead character uh, and he, right in the first 30 seconds of our six-part digital series, he gets knocked out and wakes up in 2013 Toronto and realizes that he actually has this parallel case going on in 1900 Toronto and 2013. But all the characters that he, that he knows from his life and from the show back in 1900 are reimagined in 2013 Toronto. So again, fans can see it, they recognize the show, but it's something they would never see on TV because the TV wouldn't do that. Um, tween series are a bit different. We also do a lot of tween projects and by sort of teen, tween, child question. Yeah. Are you trying to create more audience for the original series or just to create Yes. The, the, goal, the goal is always, I mean, the television is still the mothership, so uh, the, the goal is still to um, uh, create new audience for these shows or, or keep, and I think it's actually said more with tween series, uh, keep people engaged with that product between the week. If the show is only on once a week, every Saturday morning at 11 a.m., uh, what is your audience doing the rest of the time? And so with, with the adult stuff, it's slightly different. I mean, that's... Uh, it also comes into funding and sort of the mandates we have in Canada and, and not forced to do these things, but they really want to encourage digital platforms and, and, and growing this industry. And so in doing that, I think what we're doing is we're showing, uh, in terms of the numbers we used to see if in making games and more ARG-like experiences, and that was maybe 5% crossover, sometimes 10%. Uh, with the adult stuff, we're getting up to 20, 30%. And with Overruled here, which was a, a tween show, we actually increased series viewership by 26% by doing the, the online portion, over you, Overruled You Rule. Um, and that's where it's about a teen court, and these characters instead presented their own personal issues to kids um, through sort of this interactive video interface where kids could sort of um, listen to both sides of an argument and then through a community chat feature debate about who is right and wrong and this thing in about seven weeks generated a million video views uh, I think 370,000 votes and and was really strong and I, I think um, there's no denying that for transmedia and for sort of more of these extended projects uh, you're gonna find a much more fertile audience in the in the kids world and, and Baxter was another one of those um, I'm gonna use video because that explains it better than me rambling so uh, this one here is called Murdoch Mysteries, The Curse of the Lost Pharaohs, which we did for season four of Murdoch. Um, uh, we were lucky enough to get an a, a Emmy nomination for this, just, uh, which just passed. We did not win, unfortunately, but so life goes. I'm going to show a couple minutes here, not the full thing, but I think this will give you a sense of sort of what we, uh, what we do and, and how we approach it and the production values and so on and so forth. And I'm going to plug this in and it's going to pop. Huh, not so bad. My name is George Crabtree. By day, I help to solve crimes with my companions of the Toronto Police. By night, my inspiration pulls me into extraordinary places, weaving tales of mystery and heart-pounding adventure. Please join me and step inside my imagination as my first novel unfolds. Oh, for the love of... 
As transmedia companion content for season four of the award-winning television series Murdoch Mysteries, Smoke Bomb Entertainment created the 13-part digital series The Curse of the Lost Pharaohs. The goal of the project was to create a companion experience to support the television series that would appeal to the existing fan base while providing a gateway into the series for a new and younger audience. Produced by Shaftesbury Films for City TV in Canada, the television series follows Detective William Murdoch and his companions as they investigate crimes at the turn of the century. Using forensic techniques considered to be radical for the time period, Murdoch is able to solve the most complicated of cases. For Curse of the Lost Pharaohs, Smoke Bomb worked with the series producers to weave an ongoing sea storyline through the entire fourth season of the television show that follows Murdoch's bumbling sidekick, Constable George Crabtree. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not wearing a dress. Not again, anyway. As inspired by Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, he decides to pen his first adventure novel. On television, Crabtree begins taking inspiration from the cases he and Inspector Murdoch are investigating. Like the sixth plague of Egypt. Beg your pardon? Yes, sir, the sixth plague of Egypt. I've been researching it for my murder mystery. In eight of the 13 episodes, viewers watch as the Crabtree storyline progresses. Online each week, immediately following the television broadcast, viewers were then able to watch the next chapter of Crabtree's book, The Curse of the Lost Pharaohs, come to life. Through Crabtree's imagination, Murdoch and the rest of the core team at Police Station 4 are transformed into larger-than-life versions of themselves. Detective Murdoch becomes a man possessed with even greater brilliance and cunning skills. You'll have to decide, George, between death and a broken watch. The reserved and charming forensic pathologist Dr. Julia Ogden becomes a lethal seductress. But as for my would-be robber, he's soon to awaken as a guest of the constabulary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well done. But enough about me. The Graf Inspector Thomas Brackenreed becomes the burly British brawler who settles scores with his fists. I just knocked out the Cabbagetown Colossus when I had a strange premonition that you two gentlemen needed my assistance. And the bumbling Crabtree, who's always been Murdoch's subordinate, becomes his intellectual equal and for the first time gets the girl. Crabtree's observations from the world of the television series are woven into the digital series so that viewers watching both iterations can make the connections, creating a richer viewing experience. For example, on TV we see Crabtree stumped about what to do with his villain in order to move the story forward. Murdoch offers a solution to this writer's dilemma. Perhaps what you need is a surprise dramatic element, George. A twist, as it were which then appears in that week's digital episode. Oh, God, you're just a low-life criminal like I thought you were. <laughs> Blending live-action content and stunning motion comic animation drawn by well-known DC Comics illustrator Francis Manipal, The Curse of the Lost Pharaohs efficiently tells its story on a grand scale, larger and more sweeping than any television episode of Murdoch Mysteries, while remaining true to the show's core story world and characters. Curse of the Lost Pharaohs opens with the team. So yeah, so I, I think that sort of gives a, a sense of... Oh, I'm going to unplug that. Pop. Um, gives a sense of sort of how we approach uh, taking shows and, and flipping them. But now I will talk about Totally Amped and that same sort of thinking exists. Because really what we tried to do with Totally Amped is uh, instead of just being the convergent guys, uh, what we saw an opportunity to do is to do the whole thing. So we were going to do the TV show, but now we were actually in control this time. It didn't just come in after the fact they've written the scripts and, and sort of decided on the world. We got to control the whole world and imagined what a 360 experience would look like as an app. So I'm going to again start to introduce this with a piece of video. You ready to shoot for the stars? Get ready, cause Charlie Eva's looking for the next big act to open his concerts at the end of the month. Oh, yeah. You got a good voice? No, I don't. I just... Tomorrow, 5 p.m. sharp. Can you make it? Hold on, what do you mean by sharp? They 
really don't wow me. Since I'm mostly made of wow, I need my clothes to keep up. Cute is gonna be when I land record deals and you don't. Girls, I know you like this. So who can blame you? I'm bang. Can't get enough from you ladies? Brando, please. We have eyes. When you go to start the show, you'll understand how much pressure is on a plate lady. It's like being an air traffic controller who's also really hot. There's only one girl on my mind. Oh, yeah, isn't it? I don't even know if she feels the same way. I'm gonna call you Pooh Bear. You know why? Because you must be rolling in honey. <laughs> Meet the competition. That's our song. Did you just realize you're gonna lose? That's for people too stupid to cheat. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Who wants a little inspiration? Letty, you have a beautiful voice. Stop hiding it. We're gonna open for Charlie Beavers. You know it's a contest, right? Okay, totally amped. Let's do this. Two punch. So that uh, looks like a trailer for a film or, or any sort of tween series, but that is a trailer for this. So uh, the show and all the activities are contained within this. We made it for iTouch, uh, iPad, and iPhone. And I will start to explain why we did it for those and also show this in a second. But I will go back to the beginning to start. So. This was made possible, some of you may know, some of you may not know. We do have uh, some excellent funding systems in Canada uh, that allow us to experiment and make digital content like this. And um, in this case, this was done, uh, the Canadian Media Fund, the CMF. Um, we, uh, a year and a half ago, they launched a stream called the Experimental Stream. Um, and so right there is their mandate. Uh, um, sort of condensed. They, they really wanted to look for applications that were going to push the industry and, and um, I think in their minds at times it seemed like the application they wanted someone to invent the next Facebook. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that was sort of the thinking behind it is, is not only convergent content we've done before give us something new. Uh, I believe there was 170 applications in the first round of which 18 were awarded and we were lucky enough to, to be one of those with Totally Amped. Um, but I, I, I will say funds like CMF, the Bell Fund, the OMDC, uh, Telefilm, um, they really do make this possible or certainly help make it possible and, and so uh, we would not have projects like this or, or be able to stand here as easily w without them. So I, I do like to give them a shout out. Um, sort of what we approach this thinking is what if we could become the broadcaster and by that I mean removing them from the equation and uh, we'll sort of come back to that right at the very end but the thinking being is this day and age with this type of technology online and I think more so with the app do you need them anymore or can you go and independently create content um, and now that especially Apple has created a closed, essentially, payment system. And I think now the, the apps more so are things that we understand and accept. Is there a way, and could you go and bypass them, um, raise the financing yourself, broadcast it, and take those revenues and cut them out of the equation? So that was sort of one of the fundamental questions and goals that we wanted to go into this to explore. Um, it, it began with, again, part of this was our parent company and they have a, a successful kids division and so they were sort of pushing for us to do that, to, to do something in the tween market. But um, we also found sort of in the research that especially in the app world, um, there, there isn't much, uh, especially when skewing into female uh, specifically, I mean there's some cheesy fingernail painting things and, and uh, you know, little word games, but there's not real, genuine, bold content. I think for the male demographic, there's more of those sort of hardcore video games, but for females, not as much. Obviously, there's the Angry Birds and unisex stuff everywhere, but, but we wanted to go and focus and to skew into that market. Um, and I guess I should say, we began by thinking in our old ways, and we caught ourselves doing that, is, is what we were thinking is, let's make an online series and what we'll do is we'll then develop the convergent portion or the thing that we would normally do as an app. Um, but the more research we did, uh, the more companies I went and spoke to, 
Uh, I do actually remember the day I was in uh, the cab coming back from, from meeting with the company XMG, who went on to actually develop this app in the end. And they were sort of just giving us some, some statistics ab about the mobile space, and they were showing some of the success they were having. They'd just come off um, something called Style Studio, which is, you, you'll see even part of this in this, and they'd just done 4 million downloads of that. And uh, we were looking at statistics like um, in 2010, uh, the, the tween demo said 70% uh, said their next uh, f uh, phone purchase would be a smartphone. And I think there's no denying that uh, more and more we see sort of that idea of the independence and the independence of my content moving into those mobile devices. So it sort of both hit us, why are we even messing on online? What if this whole thing just went mobile? And, and that's where um, the application process began and we started to develop the creative around what this could look like strictly as a mobile series. Uh, so, uh, you know, the next question comes and it's been asked a lot. Why don't you do this for Android? Why just Apple? Um, there's, a, there's a few reasons for that. Um, part of it is, I think, especially with Apple, there is no denying that now um, I, I think apps are something we get. Uh, and I think there's sort of a language for an app. And if, if someone says, I have an app, you, you sort of know that that's in our lexicon as an understanding in, in mainstream society, not even in digital society. And I think more so with that, we accept that there is a fee with an app. And uh, especially dealing in the tween market, um, you know, we still expect online content to be free. And so that's part of it, is, is if we rent and release this as an online series and want you to pay through PayPal or something like that, it's gonna be, uh, you know, I don't wanna pay for this. But, but in a sense, apps have been accepted. Not that, not, ne not that necessarily everyone pays for apps, but there is a known uh, qualitative currency to that. And, it, and that sort of came to this thing of bypassing the broadcaster. Um, as I said, statistics were showing that way. And in truth, uh, part of what we're trying to do is be successful in applications and going back to what the CMF was looking for to be really innovative. Um, no one had done this at that point when we, were, when we were developing this application in the spring of 2010. There was nothing like this in the app market. So that is why we chose it. I think to develop for Android, you then open a whole other can of worms. Not that we won't and couldn't down, down the road, but even things like screen size, uh, things like pirating, th those all sort of come into it. So uh, the OS platform did offer a nice little closed uh, sandbox for us to develop in. Um, we wanted to go female, skewing 8 to 12, uh, and focus on music and performance. I think, again, that was sort of our, our parent company in there. They had recently done a series like that. And also there was no denying especially then, now it's a year and a half, two years later, but even so, these are things, sort of universal hits for that age demographic. The American Idols, the Glees, uh, much music. I mean, these were all sort of uh, words and, and, and thoughts and things that we wanted to pull from as we went and made this. Um, I've said this in boardrooms sometimes to uh, TV people and older executives and got weird looks. To me, it makes complete sense. Maybe it makes complete sense to you as well, but if you want a 12-year-old to watch something these days and think it's cool, don't make it for a 12-year-old. Make it for a 14 or 15-year-old. Uh, if you try and come at them right in line, you're just going to be dismissed. And so I think you really, it's really about making aspirational content. And so that doesn't mean that you go and you put swearing and violence and sex into it, but there is the maturity, and I think more so now than ever, in terms of the way you even write comedy and set up a comedy beat. Don't go and put in little sound effects when someone slips and falls. Like, that, that, that sort of thinking, and I, I do see it still a lot in children's, uh, tweens television. Um, to me, I, I think we're past that, and I think that uh, even a 10-year-old, a 9-year-old is so savvy now they're going to be on to watching Glee and adult series like that if they're not already. So um, that was a big part of how we wanted to approach making this. And so from day one, I went out and we brought in our, our lead writer. Uh, she came from an adult, sort of a, a teen, young adult comedy series called Being Erica that's in Canada. I think ABC might be remaking it here. But, but that sensibility. And then within that room, we did bring in some, some tween uh, writers, but that was more to do some punch passes and sort of to add that voice, but really want to make sure that, that we were developing something that was skewing up. 
um, in casting as well. I put not Canadian, uh, but that is something I feel, and, and that's something in the Canadian market, that's a dirty thing to say if I was in Canada, but I'm down here, so I'm going to say it. And I really wanted to do American-style content, and to me, I can see the difference. Uh, to me, I can see there is a, uh, a bit more of a maturity and a bit more of a, uh, an attempt to take risks. I think great content is done in Canada, and um, otherwise all our writers and directors and actors are down here doing it for, for American networks, but I really want to make sure that we are casting at age. I think I've seen some shows, you'll go and you'll see they're casting 23-year-old guys to play 17, 16-year-old kids, and again, I, I don't think kids buy that anymore, so I'm happy to say that uh, all of our actors, other than one, played within one year of age in this, so most of our cast was 18 playing 17, 16 year olds, um, and our young girl Lexi, she was actually 12 playing 12. That took a lot of casting to find that, but, but that was the goal. Uh, and then finally the music, and that was a big part of this, is if we're going to make a series about music performance, let's not leave music as the afterthought. And so we brought in a company called Jingle Punks, which is uh, uh, actually has offices here in New York and LA, but their lead composer, Jared Goodstad, is Canadian. And um, we brought in his team, and that, that was, again, a major focus of this project, is if kids listen to this music and it's lame and it's not something they could hear on MTV, then we're sunk before we've started because we're just going to be dismissed as, as old people trying to talk to them. So, you know, talk down to them. We had to really come at them as something aspirational, cool, and hip. Um, Content-wise, so I put a TV there, and really that's what it was, is this an app TV show, and that was in the center. And so thinking about experiences, and, and this is sort of still from the application thinking point of, okay, so now we've got a TV show, it's about the performing arts, what can we do on, a, on an interactive device? Um, certainly the idea of music is there, and this is obvious stuff, but you'll see as we come to what it actually looked like, it was to do something around music, and how can I play with the music? Uh, how can I play with the video? Um, lots of music videos in this, we were making music videos as part of this story, so how can I become, how can I take a role in, in making videos myself as a user? Uh, fashion, I think that is always, again, a touchstone of trying to go after the 8 to 12 market, and that's a part of music and performance, and what outfit am I going to wear on stage? So, so that, was, uh, that was of interest to us. Um, this is where we start to learn things that we wanted to do but didn't actually make it in. So the idea of doing a community, and I think going back to what we saw with the project Overruled, where we gave kids not only content but the ability to discuss content with each other and debate with content with each other, that was something that they latched on to um, uh, extremely well and 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 it 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 also in a sense is very cheap to produce because you give them the forum to have that discussion and you're not creating that content anymore they're quite happy just going back and forth and arguing and discussing and build 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 so uh, in the end due to uh, legal was a big part of it um, in terms of if it was a broadcaster and they had this they have moderation teams already in place uh, us being the broadcaster, and this is where we start to learn some of these rules about trying to be it, um, was going to be a very expensive undertaking to launch an app worldwide and then start dealing with moderation. We discussed if you have enough pays, you know, that would pay for itself, but at the time it just seemed like one bridge too far with everything else we were trying to do. Um, I put avatar there, that was part of the legal thing, you can't put up your photos, then you're going to create an avatar of yourself. But again, as we thought about it, where we're spending the money, now suddenly we're spending a good chunk of our $10 on just creating an avatar building system so you can upload an image of yourself in this community. And to me, that wasn't putting our money into uh, the best areas. And really, that was into really high quality video production, music production. And then, I mean, I mean that is where the majority of our our money went for this thing. Uh, the chat feature, and then we were going to have this thing called Star Power, which again is a great idea, and you can go and you can actually create this content and then go head to head with other kids and create, win points for that, and all part of sort of that idea of gamification. Maybe that's version 2.0, but at the time we had to sort of let some things go. So, so those sort of 
the whole community sharing chat thing is, is sort of fell by the wayside as we got deeper into it. Uh, creating a look was also a big thing we wanted to do and we wanted to create a unique look um, that A, again as we're going out on a new platform stood out as something different and made us not just blended with everyone else. So we brought in a commercial production designer named Jeremy McFarlane who had some great ideas and uh, the idea here, what you're looking at uh, is that. So we did all these uh, sets, 70% of them, some were done on green screen, but on translite plates. So a translite, uh, if you don't know, whenever they shoot on a set um, uh, for any TV show or film and you can see the, the skyline in the back, that's a translite as well. And what that is is essentially tarp and they just backlight through an image. So you print an image on a tarp and you backlight through it and it looks incredibly real. And part of that is you can control the lighting and you can highlight and low light and it really gives it a nice texture and look. So we took that thinking and drew uh, three dimensional spaces that we then animated over and then printed onto these plates. You can actually see, there we are, Again, filming. So, so that's all it is. But because, uh, and Jeremy did a lot of work with this in, in design programs before, he figured out how far we could actually move the camera within that 3D environment. So you can see on this one, that is a plate that we've printed. So that is completely flat, she is, which he has drawn the, the, the disappearing points. But then once you go and you run that through a camera lens, shining light down through the top of those so we actually get the sense that we are in this environment and really playing with this idea of half real world half cartoon and it and I was very impressed actually with the way this turned out um, one of the lessons is I mean we did still have green screen throughout a lot of this uh, that is a lesson <laughs> uh, which I, I think in the end I had to deal with about 350 VFX shots for this thing which someone told like was equal to what Transformers had going on. It, it was nuts because we thought at the time, I think to produce each plate, to design it, draw it, print it was about 2,400 bucks. And sometimes we had very short scenes. And so I was like, oh, I'll do it on green screen and we'll bang it in the end. But that actually proved to be more expensive than just quite frankly printing the plate and, and using it for one shot. Uh, but we had monitors, we had cell phones going everywhere in this thing. So uh, green screen was still a big part of this. Uh, those are some t statistics from what the shoot was. So uh, another thing that some people like, some people don't like, uh, depends if you're a union, an actor, or if you're a producer, but we're pretty good at banging off a lot of pages a day. So uh, for some of those things I showed you earlier, like Switch and Curse Lost Pharaohs, we're doing like 16, 17 pages a day. Uh, essentially that means two cameras, I call them two take wonders. Uh, it is not necessarily the ideal way to make shows, but in this case, um, even with 16 cast, we had a fantastic group. I think I heard Lion called twice. I mean, we just went in there like maniacs and uh, banged this thing off. Block shooting was a big part of that though. So we'd put up one tarp, like one translite, and we would shoot every scene that existed on that translite, be it episode one, five, or ten. Then we would actually, in a room, something like the, uh, the warehouse, we would then go and put up the second translite, so the other wall, we'd French reverse all the actors standing in that, and then shoot all the, the over the shoulders for that. So we had great first ADs who were able to keep track of all this. It was a bit insane. In the end, ended up with about 60 minutes of finished content, um, and seven music videos. So we did get a lot of bang for our buck. Uh, now I'm going to show you what's actually in this app. Pop. Let's see if this works. We've sort of tried this before. So I'm not allowed to pick it up. Nice. Right? Oh. 
give it 10 more seconds and we're going to abandon this. Nice. Cool. Yay. So, uh, this is the app. Um, we really did actually try and keep this pretty simple in terms of app design. Again, that was somewhat of a conscious choice, somewhat of a budgetary choice. Uh, I, this, uh, we were lucky enough to go into Apple headquarters and sort of meet with the, the head honchos there. And um, sort of their lead tech developer came in their, their lead creative came in and said they love it and it's innovative, this is fantastic. Then their lead tech guy came in and uh, just tore it all the shreds. He's like, I wouldn't do it like this and this isn't, uh, where's the elegance, where's the elegance? Um, which, <laughs> because I mean, well no, they want, like, they're in the business of doing all these great and flashy apps, which is, which is fantastic. But I think, again, for the market that we were going after and we were doing something so new and, and budgetary, but I, I don't think, because we're even going as young as four or five, I mean, we have fans that young, that this was necessarily the place to go and focus on that. I think we really wanted a clean, simple, intuitive point and click. So I clicked episodes, I go in here and I get all the episodes. So we can do that. Yeah, let's watch a... And this is just sort of show you, this is the opening episode. So sort of that, again, that blend between the live action. And so even with these translog plates, we'd put physical objects. So bed's real, desk's real, computer's real, but then on the translate world. So you get 10 episodes, but then you get the activities. And so the way it worked is after each episode, a uh, new piece of content would uh, unlock in each one of these activities. So there's actually a lot of bonus content around it. Uh, in the music studio, so again, we come back to, we want to somehow be able to play with music. So you can remix and record. So uh, all of the songs, and what you would have done is, I'll do a little remix of Castaway here. Uh, the episode where the Castaway song has played, and then that now unlocks in the music mixer for me to play with and make my own version of. So uh, let's start just with some drum. Now I'm sitting on an SOS like singer to put my message in a bottle. Love's an island, it's far away. Like an ocean, many miles away. Put a message in a bottle. Read it out to me. Oh, shout it out. Oh, oh, oh. Shout it from the rooftops. So you can play with the music and you can uh, record all your creations and you can save all your creations within it. Uh, better and more exciting for the children of the world, um, if you so desire, you can go, no, I don't want to listen to it again. Um, yeah, yes. You can go and actually be the star yourself by recording your own voice. So I will save a uh, some of you, the, uh, the magic of me rapping along to this. But this is the karaoke version of Totally Amp. So for all the songs, seems like yesterday, not long ago. Uh, and you can now, you can be the star. And that's what's so cool, right? Is that I've watched this show. I love the music. I love these characters. Now I get to step in their shoes and be a part of it. And after you've recorded, we can save. We can put it into the re music mixer. And then you can actually go and so re... I will save... Uh, some of you, the, uh, the magic of me rapping along to this. But this is the karaoke version of Totally Amp. So for all the songs, it seems like yesterday, not long ago. Uh, and then, you know, and then I'll let him take it. So you can actually go and become a star on stage with these kids as well. And that, I think, as a kid or as an adult, is pretty cool. Um, next, the idea that we've made music videos and you want to interact with that. 
So we can go and we can become the music di video director. Let's do Speed of Love. Uh, this is Delicious Dynamite. They were our uh, arch enemy evil group. Um, I actually think we could take them to Germany and have some success. Um, <laughs> So you just simply tap, point and click, and I am actually cutting this video. We initially wanted to actually do four, uh, four screens going at once. The processing power for that, we are just pushing iPad. Some quick cuts. I think this is all editors do, actually. I'm joking, I love editors. So then, let's watch what I created. Um, so yeah, we, I, 4 was just a bit too much. That would have been sweet, but again, that's version 2.0. And, and that was the thing. As we got closer and closer to launch, some things just had to go. The share feature, unfortunately, had to go. The idea being is I could create any of this and immediately push it to my Facebook account. I could push it out on Twitter. Um, we were running up against some programming issues and actually moving that much content off the app. So I think we actually, we were due to launch, I mean, three days later, or, or at least put it into the App Store for approval, and at that point, unfortunately, had to, had to decide to, to, to um, ax it. Uh, and, and then I think that's another thing. You'll notice the video quality in this, and it's sort of hard to tell on the giant screen here, but uh, that was another place we had to cut back. You go and you shoot all this stuff. It's beautiful. It's on red cams. And then to get it down to a file size that is actually manageable, it shouldn't be saving that long, by the way. Um, uh, why are you doing that to me? Not in front of everybody. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm going to kill him for a sec. Um, uh, we had to... Uh, damn you. It was a wicked video, I promise you. Uh, feel free to download it. Uh, first episode is free. The rest is... I'll get to that in a sec. Um, and then the design studio. And so this is where we took actually something that XMG had had some success with. Obviously with 4 million downloads, we felt that there was maybe something there, this idea of style studio. So uh, here we can go and we can design our own dress. Uh, that looks like a nice one. We can go materials, uh, sparkly. Yep, let's do that. But then let's add something. Ooh, hot lips. That, and I can move with my fingers and place, double tap, <laughs> maybe add a rose for good measure. Like yeah, as you, uh, and then maybe we want to go and say, let's say cool. <laughs> and then, boom. I would buy that. That's worth at least $60. Uh, so I'm going to save it. I'll save that as A. And then I can actually go through the process of using this. So those are some of my previous designs. <laughs> um, now I can dress the characters. So let's take Madison. And we, there was a lot of debate about how we were going to show these kids. First it was like bikini stuff, but then when you're putting a 12-year-old in bikinis, it got uh, a bit weird. So, uh, But now, do that. how does that look for a We've, we've seen some kids do weird things like put shoes on their hands and sort of some weird creations have come out of this. Uh, so I can save that. And then I can actually go and put this into something. So you can create wallpapers, you can create screen savers. Take that one. Let's put them in the lounge. Cast. Madison's creation. You know, boom. Maybe throw... A man hunk in there for <laughs> boom. Uh, then I can add text, and, and again, you could see this is where, unfortunately, that sharing feature that we had to drop would have been amazing, because now I can go and create this, and I, you can still, we've seen kids do it, they take screenshots of the stuff, they are still finding ways to get it out, but in the ideal world, I could press a button right now, and that could be on Facebook, and, and that was a, an unfortunate thing. So those are the elements of the app. Uh, let's get on to the big questions. So this is now where we start to learn about what we meant. Uh, the deployment strategy was something we went back and forth on, is how do we actually, I'm going to unplug this pop, uh, get this thing out. Um, it was a question of, and this is the thing, is 
with something this size, uh, you need to be on Wi-Fi, obviously. You cannot download through 3G. And also with our target demographic, a lot of them having eye touches, you don't even necessarily have 3G as an option. So if you have to go Wi-Fi, what are you asking of your audience? And the main debate was, do we put this thing all out at once as one big download that you have to sit there and wait for? Or do we release it episode by episode? Um, obviously, the argument for episode by episode is you don't have to sit and wait, and with an eight-year-old and having to wait 20 minutes for something could be a sort of barrier to entry. <laughs> but, uh, but my sort of my point of view, and, and it was agreed upon by a number of us, is the other problem is also for an eight-year-old, if I'm in the back of my parents' van and we're on the way to the airport and I'm stuck at episode two and I want episode three and I can't get that till I get somewhere with Wi-Fi, that is also a major barrier to entry. So the decision was uh, we would release it all at once. Um, it would be that freemium model of we give away episode one for free and all the content with it and then it's a one-time payment and you lock every, unlock everything else. But to get that first episode you do have to do the full download. And so that will come back to the lesson learned at the end. The size in the end ended up being oh yeah, oh, I am looking at these slides and you guys are looking at a black screen. Um, the size in the end actually was one gigabyte. Uh, just shy, I think like 970. Um, and that is, oh, you're gonna come in. That, that is still crushing things down. So each one of those episodes, we were getting down to like 50 megabytes. And, and on, an iP on an iPhone, they look fantastic. On an iPad, you know, it's not, it's not where I'd want it to be. Um, but each sort of package, if you want to think about it, each episode's package was sort of 80, 90 megabytes, which doesn't sound a lot, but multiply that by 10, and that's how we get to a gig. So depending on your connection speed, usually that's about a 20, 30 minute wait from clicking it to see even the first free episode. And so that is sort of a question that still remains, but I have an answer for it in the end. Price point, free, obviously not. 99 cents, especially trying to create something new here. To me and to us, that seemed like we were sort of underselling what we're actually trying to create. Uh, how do you go, oh, I'm about to run out of battery, shit. Um, how do you go and give something away for 99 cents and then ever come back and, and try and raise that? So we thought what was fair for an hour's worth of content, I have a plug-in if you have an extension cord, um, that $4.99. That's the price of renting a video these days. It's, uh, the thinking being is after 99 cents, once I'm paying $2.99, will I pay $4.99? And in truth, and again, another interesting barrier to entry is really to pay anything, you need your parents. And so that comes back to sort of how we wanted to promote this. Uh, and that's how we built the audience. Um, we wanted to come at it from two angles, obviously from the industry side and from the audience side. And even, and, and from, the, from the audience side, this is again where we come back to, can we do this without the broadcaster? Um, can we be the megaphone? So, uh, uh, and also, how do we reach both kids and parents? And those are two entirely different marketing campaigns and strategies, but we need the kids to know about it so they'll go and tell mom and dad that they want it, but we need the parents to know about it so when the kids come and say that, they're like, well, what am I spending $4.99 for? And also in some of our research, we're finding, especially at these younger ages, in a lot of cases, it's actually parents who are discovering apps and buying them and presenting them to their children. So, um, for the industry, we used Shaftesbury Publicity in Canada. That's our parent company's uh, publicity wing. And then in the States, we used a company here called One PR, uh, who both did great work. Um, and in, for the audience side, we used a company out of uh, Toronto called the Fisheye Corporation, or Fisheye, uh, to do the social media side of things. And then we also partnered with a company called Wattpad, um, which is a young adult fiction writing site, and I'll get to that, and that was actually a pretty cool idea. So, in terms of uh, industry-wise, that worked great. Uh, everyone who saw it and reviewed it, um, we did very well, and, and everyone could obviously see, on, always see the potential in what we were talking about. So, uh, both here in the States, in India, we were getting articles, uh, Canada, Europe, um, it, it, it got great buzz. 
Uh, for FishEye's side of things, we sort of did what I would call the standard you know, social media shotgun blast against the wall and hit everything, but still keeping it integrated. Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, website. Um, all of these things sort of contesting across all platforms. Uh, but the big thing that we tried to do different is we also went after what we called mommy and daddy bloggers, mainly mommy bloggers. So we actually brought uh, nine of the largest sort of parent uh, technology bloggers across the United States up to Toronto for two days uh, while we were in production to watch us shoot, to meet the cast. Uh, then we actually did a brainstorm with them really to try and involve them in this process. Um, and not only bring them on side, but sort of th then we would be able to use them going forward and spread that message. I will say in the end, uh, first lesson, I mean, that exercise alone was probably about $15,000. I would have bought Facebook ads, quite frankly, but these are the things we learn and we are now getting into the lesson learning portion of this presentation. Um, not that I think that was the wrong idea, but for the impact that that probably got in the end to spend $15,000 on eight people to write some reviews, really what we learned is well, they'll write the reviews for free in a way. And, and, and the idea of bringing them on side was not any greater benefit than you could have gotten from simply uh, engaging people like all the other free, free and blogger press we got. And so that, that was a, a lesson learned, a good attempt, but a lesson learned. Um, in, in terms of the way we wanted to approach building the audience for the tweens, it's really about loving these characters. And we started from day one with that. So we actually brought an entire, uh, with, a, with a tween host onto the set who spent, out of our six days of production, four days on set doing sort of weird little spots. I think we created uh, 73 video assets of behind the scenes production of different interviews and sort of what's your favorite milkshake flavor and all those things. We just created content, content, content that we could then slowly drip out in the lead up to launch. Um, we released episode one for free on YouTube on Christmas morning. So the idea of a Christmas pro so again, we for about two weeks leading up, we were teasing that on our Facebook page, Twitter page, we have a surprise, we have a surprise, and that was giving episode one away for free. Was that the right idea? Uh, my executive producer at Smoke, he would say no. He would say he thinks that we should have kept that under wraps. I still think for the audience and the traffic we were able to drive, uh, AOL Kids picked it up. I mean, I think we probably uh, drove something like 320,000 video impressions off that from starting from zero, and again from zero, I think there was a benefit to, to releasing that episode. Um, I think the what count... What was the distance between that and launch? Uh, at that point, we were a month away. We launched January 26th. I think the counter argument to releasing it is, as with anything, it's the same reason that movies sometimes don't want to screen at press time. You know, you get one shot. If they don't like it, you've lost them forever. But Again, I think of the medium we're in, we're still asking them to go and do something totally different anyways, to go and download this app and do these different things they're not used to. So let's at least let them know what they're getting into and hopefully they're excited enough and we'll wait the 20 minutes to get it. Um, we released recording sessions. So all the music we recorded, we were doing iPhone videos of that, of the dance rehearsals. Um, we made videos of our cast demoing the app and sort of giving shout outs to different audience. We did contest and prizing with our characters. So that she was here sending this video to give away that dress. And again, contest around the, around the content. So let's hear you sing your best version of one of those songs using the app, upload that to Facebook, upload that to YouTube, and you'll be entered for your chance to win. Um, we did a countdown. We did a launch party that we actually live streamed through Facebook. So that way our audience around the world could join us for that. And then we actually brought the cast in front of the cameras. People could ask questions. Um, really trying to build, uh, we, we did a contest where we brought out some fans and actually brought them to our launch party and then did an interview with them about why they love the product. And this is all on the day it launched. So this is all lead up to that launch day to really build that buzz. Uh, flyers at One Direction concerts, that was live stream, and then again, we're mailing out prizes. And this is all pre-promotion to try and be the megaphone and to replace the broadcaster. Uh, and the other cool thing, and this is actually, this one's pretty cool, Wattpad uh, is, a, is a young adult 
uh, fiction site where uh, amateur writers, people are not paid for this, um, write stories. And they will write usually like 26 chapters, like a lot, but each chapter is four pages. And some of these writers have millions and millions of followers. So in partnering with Wattpad, what we actually did is we took five of their most popular writers and gave them each a character from our story and Rashomoned it, where we took the moment at uh, the end of episode one, our big cliffhanger when our, when our group learns that they're actually gonna all be working together, and we told the backstories through writing that we released on Wattpad of how they got to that moment. Some characters were two days before, some characters were 10 years before but they all sort of led up to that moment at the episode one. We promoted it on Wattpad, obviously the idea being we had a built-in fan base there because people are already reading these authors' works in the millions. And we were releasing videos like hey guys, this. Oh, well, give me the sound machine. <laughs> we're doing well. Uh, videos like Hey guys, I'm Christine Presberry and I play Aria on Totally Amped. Totally Amped is unlike anything you've ever seen before. It's an app about a teen pop band with activities that make you a part of the action. Read my character story by XO Stardust. You can read it here on Wattpad.com. The Totally Amp app will be released on January 26, 2012 in the Apple App Store. I cannot wait. It's really the coolest thing I've ever worked on and I cannot wait for you guys to see it. Oh, and don't forget to join us on our Totally Amped Facebook page. Myself and other cast members will be making appearances and you guys can even win some cool stuff from the shoot. Thank you. <laughs> So obviously we saw the Wattpad way as a way to tap a major audience that we otherwise would not have been able to get FaceTime with because that was sort of built in. Successes. We launched it. Uh, <laughs> so it successfully launched it at midnight on January 26th. Uh, I think in terms of production values, the goals we set out with, again, and this is me saying this, but we'll get to sort of some things that do back that up is to really make something that competes with American production values um, and something really unique in, the, in its look and the way it was cast and the music. I, I, I think we, we hit those things with, with great music. Um, uh, certainly critically wise and for press and for our company and for the app itself, I mean if, if the reviewers each bought a million downloads each, we'd do very well, but, but they didn't because they get it for free. Um, it opened a lot of broadcasters' eyes, uh, and the story that, uh, again, our executive producer Daniel has from MIP, where um, we were one of 20 companies selected to go and pitch to Nickelodeon. And so the way they set it up there is they got a boardroom table with about 16 executives from around the world, all sitting there, and these TV producers come in, and they get their 10 minutes, and everyone goes and puts their DVD in the machine and plays their pilot. Um, and uh, Daniel walked in, and... Held up, uh, held up an iPad, and uh, they so their sort of reaction was faces dropping and very interested. And uh, uh, both, both, I think it was Nickelodeon who said, "We have teams work trying to work on this stuff right now. We're trying to figure out how to do this, but you have beaten us to it." Uh, Disney also saw it at MIP, and the thing that I'm that I was really happy to hear and very proud to hear is that Disney said we did Disney. As they looked at it and they said, this is Disney content. And Disney actually wanted to buy it. And we said no, because, <laughs> because well, two reasons. One, uh, we'd gone that far, and we were a, a couple weeks from launching, we'd gone that far, and the idea of not seeing this through to see if we could show that we could do it without the broadcaster Actually, I, we didn't want to do that. We actually wanted to see if we could do it. We wanted to see if we could prove this point. Uh, and the other problem is with Disney and really all these giant corporations, especially with Disney, it's interesting to note, they have a head for each department. So they have their TV head, their music head, their mobile head, and their uh, digital head. And to sell a project like this to them, all four of those people have to agree on it. And it's not, you, the TV guy just can't, or the mobile guy just can't say we're doing this because the music guy has to buy into the music they're releasing. And um, 
that proves difficult and that takes maybe even a year, like we were talking about, we might have just have to delay this and work this out. We didn't want to do that. And they would also own it. You don't really do rev shares with Disney. They cut you a check and bye-bye, and it's, it's there. So we elected not to do it at that point. And we did get a very strong view of response. Um, uh, our ratings are excellent. Uh, this released at midnight on January 26th, and at 6 a.m. on January 26th, on our Facebook page, people, all our fan, all this building we'd done, people were loving it and saying, what's next? <laughs> and, and that actually comes down to one of the major fundamental lessons with this whole experience is we blew our load in four hours after all that. And the tween audience these days, and, and this is what we thought, right? We thought that this is the new day and age. None of us want to go and sit down every Tuesday to wait for our TV show to come on. We just, we want to watch it when we want to watch it. And, and especially with that demo, and that's what we're thinking. That's what they want to do, which is true. That is what they want to do. The problem is, is they just watched all the episodes and played all the games and were done in three hours. And so we didn't realize, and now this is where it starts, is the broadcaster lesson, or I think the main thing we would have done different, is we missed the opportunity to build a story about this. Is if we had released it over 10 weeks, then we have, between each week, a chance for them to be talking about it, a chance for them to be doing contesting around it, a chance for them to get excited about what was going to happen next. And that is one of, is that my first? Yes, the release strategy. That is one of the fundamental lessons. And to do it again, which I think we're going to, and that's my final slide, I would, I would, I don't think that's the rule, but I got to say, number one with a bullet, it was that, is there was no, we lost them at that point. And, and that was the thing, just like piranhas in the water, it was eaten and gone, and they were on to the next. Um, size, and we still debate that if that was an issue, there is actually no way to tell if people are giving up halfway through a download, but um, I, I think it's felt by some, by our app developer, uh, by some people within our companies that one gig and 20 to 30 minute wait is just too big. So there is no way, and I'll explain how we're going to change that, but there was no way we could crush that down further, and that's what I kept reminding everyone. And I also kept saying, we have a game developer who's used to making games that are 20 or 30 megabytes, but this isn't a game. We're trying to make a, we're trying to make a TV show. There's no way you can do an hour of video content for 70 megabytes. It's just, unless it's going to look like absolute dog crap. So, uh, but size is a lesson. And then it's the megaphone. And it's trying to do this without the broadcaster. And it's not to say it can't be done. And obviously there are many, uh, uh, well, there are a lot of examples where people strike gold. And it takes off and it goes viral and people consume it. But to go and assume that you're going to be able to do that is very difficult. And if you don't have a way of reaching millions and millions and millions of eyeballs of which a fraction of that are going to come and participate, it becomes a lot harder. And that's the thing. We were reaching, uh, I mean, at launch, I think we were at, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of impressions, but that's someone looking at a video. That's a very, actually a very small pool to pull from, to actually now actually people go and download the app and pay 90, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it, it's the lack of the megaphone. And that is what I think broadcasters are still very much equipped to do is they have these giant megaphones that they can push out across all these platforms and have the resources to do that, to build audiences, to bring them to things. So, oh, and uh, this is another, is in terms of now selling this to a broadcaster and going out into international sales, nobody cares about 10 episodes. No digital broadcast, really, they can't do anything with it. It's not even worth the time for them to fill out the, all the legal paperwork they're going to broadcast it over 10 weeks, and they even know that. The kids are going to eat it. It's gone. They want 100 episodes. Even in TV, you can't sell really a TV series unless you have three seasons for the same reason, that a broadcaster, in terms of a second window deployment, it, it's not really worth them promoting that, building that audience, releasing it if it's only going to be gone after 13 episodes. And so that is another thing. But obviously we can't go and create 100 lessons, uh, episodes of these things. So these are the three... Big things we are, I think, going to take another kick at the can at. And this is sort of the approach. It is to strip out the episodes. 
and to give the episodes away essentially for free. And so what we want to do is we want to find broadcasters. Cash is great. We'll take cash. But that is not the driving factor. Is our thinking now is use the video content. Use the thing you've spent $8 on as the commercial to build the widest audience possible. And then once you have that big audience, now find opportunities to sell. And so the way we see it going is we will distribute mass. We'll throw, if necessary, we'll put it out on YouTube, Facebook it. It can sit at Disney's web. Anyone can have this. Do whatever you want with this video content. But we will hold the rights to the app. And we will sell the interactivity portions, thereby making it much smaller, much shorter download, much lower price, maybe even 99 cents. But now if you have 3 million eyeballs watching this, that is a much bigger pool to now ask people to go and download a 99 cent app for. Um, and then I think it's about extending the experience. And that's that final point of we can't make 100 digital episodes of something that, that's just not feasible in terms of the budget. So in this project and in other projects that we're working on similar to this is we're now trying to come up with ways. How do you go and you extend this experience that doesn't require you to just constantly be making new content and spending money on it. And so an example I can use is with Totally Amped, what if we go and we take this world of a music uh, 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 production company, XMP Music, and that actually exists. And so kids can go to that website every day and we'll have our characters. We can do some video content. Um, we can do some new castings. We can, we can make some new pieces of music. But then we can also take, and when you think about it like this, with, with Jingle Punks, uh, going back to our music company, the number of young upstart bands that want an audience right now, and they have no portal to do that through. Well, what if we became the portal to do that? And so we have sort of created this brand and the style, and so we actually become... We, we now start taking other people's content for free and using it on our site to build our brand, but then we can still go and sell the app, we can go and sell the t-shirt, we can go and sell the lollipops. So by extending that experience, that is something, and do contest around it, do UGC content. We're not going to have to bear the burden of creating that high quality content. And for that, to go to a broadcaster and say, I got 10 episodes, you can have them for free. You can be a part of this app experience, so this app experience does exist. And then we also have a way to extend this experience really as long as you want, as long as we want to keep up the hosting and feeding things into it and there's no dying cost. That starts to present something that is a bit more attractive than, than what we had. So after that long and winding road, that is the story of, uh, that's the story of Totally Amped, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. All right. So uh, pl I'm going to take questions and please speak into the mic. Hi. How are you doing? Um, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, so now you went from being obsessed with doing <laughs> content to only doing 10. I mean, are you looking to continue the process if you get supported by a broadcast company to develop more content? Is that the desire? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, th there's no denying that the <laughs> ultimate goal with everything we do, original okay. and Smoke Bomb, we do a few, is to do TV, okay. really. Uh, I mean, we look at these as pilots. In a way, we look at them as pilots for television series. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be pilots for digital series. I know more and more broadcasters, everyone's gone and bought their YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and they have nothing to put in it. So. Uh, um, we're actually, I'm in the process of developing another kid series right now j just for that, not to be an app thing, just to go and be digital content for a broadcaster. So we would want to make more. It's not us saying that we don't. I think it's more saying that uh, we've used the fund and until someone's willing to cut us a check to make something more, we have to come up with low cost alternatives to sort of keep the, the party rolling. Yeah. So it's still in that process, you yes. think? Yes, yeah. I agree. Uh, Jay, I had a question about um, Facebook and kids accessing. Is, is there like an age limit, and how did you guys work with that? The, uh, the, the legal answer is uh, uh, yes, uh, legally it's there. The truth of the matter is, and through all the advice and all the conversations we've had and I think that we've seen, is... There are no police or lawyers in here. Like, no one's, no one's really worried about that right now. The, the, the truth is, 9 and 10-year-olds are on Facebook, and if you don't want to go where your audience is, then you're just shooting yourself in the foot. So, um, 
it now, in true, I should also say, we saw, you can also track the demo of this, we were skewing up with a strong audience base as high as like 22, 23-year-old women. But I also know like my boss, is ki he has two three-year-old kids and every morning on the way to school they want to watch Totally Amped. And so uh, we have been able to find a bit of something over him, but yes, when it comes to those things, we sort of just said, look, that's where the audience is, that's where we want to be. So part of uh, what you talked about sounds a lot to me like um, I have a lot of friends who are content creators on YouTube and they create these, you know, episodic, you know, I'm um, uh, download every Tuesday or I'll upload a video every Wednesday. But for for them and especially for it sounds like what you guys did, you have this expectation to ascend to something greater like television or you know broadcast or whatever. But why go that direction? Like, why is why is television the ultimate goal? Why can't you just stay mobile and make millions of dollars? Um, I, well, very good point. I mean, that is that is the goal. But I mean, I work after seven years and now working for three years with a with a television pro production company that does this. To me, and again, outside of you can hit them. Like, you can hit those those ones out of the park that come out of nowhere. But the truth be told, I mean, in this industry, television is still the leader right now. And if you don't have a TV show, um, like what, what I'd love to do and what I really want to do is I want to do it all. I mean, we want to do 360 content. We want to do the TV, the online, the mobile, the live event. And that is the ultimate goal. And actually being a true 360 company that comes with all that thinking. Um, uh, I mean, part of the answer is is... At the moment, and again, specifically in the genre we're working in, you are only in charge if you are running the TV show. And um, I'm not saying we don't want to do digital series. We're actually doing another app series right now called State of Sin. Uh, and that's actually targeted at sort of sci-fi 18 to 35 male. It's actually going to be the world's first 3D app. So it, it, um, we've partnered with a company called 3D Slide that releases a slide that makes your... Uh, iPad and iPhones 3D, and it will also work on new native 3D phones. And so we're still exploring that. We're doing a, a, a digital series. But no, the truth is, I mean, even with State of Sin, the, the, the ultimate goal there right now is still for space or someone to come and say, that's great, you've shown an audience. We'd love to turn this into a TV show. And that's sort of our model, and that's the way we're working right now. And in your discussions with people, did you get the sense that there was a decent amount of development, either in cable or broadcast, that were like, oh, great, yeah, we are interested in, we'll, you know, bring this, you know, we'll develop the show, and you guys keep doing the, these other aspects of it and that going, or was it a lot of people who were like, what, I don't, you know, this doesn't make sense to us. Did people get it, or did they? Uh, no, they undeniably got it. So, I mean, again, I come back to, to, and I'll just use that, that Disney and Nick, they both like, yeah, but I think they see it in their eyes. Uh, and again, with Disney, you know, Disney wants to make their shows and produce them. And probably what makes the most sense. I guess for, that's what I was more yeah. interested in. Are there people who are like, oh, you guys are a team. Great. Be part of our team and, you know, keep doing what you're doing and just let us know how to, you know, you know, we'll help the, with the TV part because that's what we do. Yeah. But then you keep doing your thing. Yeah, I mean, th those things, and, and those are the sort of conversations we have, again, learning the lessons of sort of how the TV world works is, I'd say more so than ever, it, you can have the greatest idea on earth, who's your showrunner, and what's their track record, and what have they done, and sort of that's, so we're getting better about that. And so for the next one, we've brought in a series showrunner who's done many successful Disney series, and he's working on it, and that is sort of what gets the, the broadcaster um, to believe that it's something that we could then still go and, and run with. Do you Does that answer question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And do you have numbers on like how people are using the app now? Like once they've gotten through the content, when are they pulling it back up and rewatching the episodes, or are they spending a lot of time with the the different? Activities? Yeah, so we're still we're still having people uh, playing with it, and working with it. I, I think though, coming back to that megaphone and and extending the story, there's no denying that you know our our download it. And it's still going, and everyone says, you know, with an app, don't measure it in terms of the first month and measure it in terms of the first year because those continue. But in terms of having a story and having a megaphone to keep this message out, we have run out of steam and resources to keep that going. So our, our downloads have trickled off, but people are still posting creations on our Facebook page and, and YouTube videos. So it's still going. People are still creating ringtones with this stuff. And 
it, it's still alive. And I think more so, if we do get the opportunity, what we really want to do is pull this thing, go with a new plan, relaunch it from scratch in 2013. We have not gone wide enough it, to go with a broadcaster. This would be totally, like, not nearly enough people have seen it. It's sort of like we've done the tease. So I, I think there is the ability here to, to take another kick at the can and, and be successful, more successful. Have you thought about an educational component in your in, in developing this f further, and as well as, you know, what did you learn about the sharing aspect that you did, that you wish you would have done that you didn't do that you talked about? Right. Uh, in terms of educational, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, and and maybe you sort of come from that back. There is a whole. It's like a not a whole other set of rules, but that's a whole other kettle of fish to sort of go and start developing curriculum friendly content and that schools will actually take and almost a business within itself so with a, a product like this no I mean we were going for straight play entertainment but that's not to say that I don't think there's opportunities in other projects especially these days in more the uh, preschool uh, uh, market to create entertainment that always also acts as an education uh, tool uh, in terms of sharing I mean the thing we learned is uh, to do it was interesting, when we developed this project, we were still thinking like online developers and the things we wanted to do with that. And I think the lesson is, is that isn't necessarily possible yet with these devices. They're great, but um, I wish we had have sharing. I think that, again, would have been a great free way to spread this content wider. And in a way, without having that, it remains a closed circle. But if I see a posting on my friend's Facebook page of something cool or a song, I want to know what that is, but if, if you can't get that out, you're really relying on word of mouth, and, and that reduces the, the megaphone that we have. So uh, really, it's just the thing I learned is um, have it, if all possible, especially for this type of market and consumption market. Uh, I don't know if you can share with us some numbers, but I'm sort of curious what your production budget was for the content yeah. versus for the app, and also what your, uh, how many you've sold. Uh, I will use numbers, but I'll use loose numbers just because uh, um, we produced the, uh, this, we made this entire project for less than a million dollars. Um, the video production budget was by far the vast majority of it. I think it was just shy of $500,000. Um, the app itself was uh, less than 100, more than 50. Um, now, I mean, uh, if, if we had had a company in-house and if we had those expertise in-house, I think obviously that price could have been a lot lower because we were also paying another company's overhead. Um, but I think we did, again, for being a first out of the gate with XMG's expertise sort of in developing apps and, and how to launch them and how to get them through and sort of their expertise in numbers and design, that that, that was beneficial in this case. So that was the price. To do it again, um, you know, the whole point here in, in terms of sort of the, the, the quality of content really I have seen apps and you can do things and you can do lower price point content. My, and it comes back to where I sort of started this thing is my goal and what I'm most interested in is making mainstream transmedia content that, that I would watch or that people who aren't necessarily naturally into those things would watch. And so I think the way you have to come at it and even going back to you meant collapses, when I came into that, they wanted to make an interactive thing about oil. And I was like, oh, that sounds boring. Um, <laughs> Because it is, because we, uh, either I don't understand it, like you're just telling me the world's going to end and we're going to run out of oil, so that's a bummer. And, 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 <laughs> but no, but like how am I supposed to even, how does that even relate to me? Like r reading the books myself, I was like, okay, so in 30 years we're out of oil and it's, chaos is going to rain. And for me, for me to understand that or engage that, so really I came in and said, look, let's make this a personal story. So we put, we put characters and we did a dramatic story in here and let's open it like a, a blockbuster I did not work on the production they got it kind of close uh, I would have still gone bigger but but really catch people and hook people in ways that they understand and really put that production value up front and I think at least at this point while we're still learning to accept and use transmedia to me and I am not in any way the, the last bucket but from my approach is that is the way I want to approach it is putting the best possible television quality content forward in terms of uh, creating transmedia video content. All right, last question up there. Hi. Uh, 
you've, al you've already disclosed like how you're going to do the next steps, which is to give away the content. But what would you say to someone who wanted to follow in your footsteps and say that like the next hour of content for Totally Amped was like an in-app purchase for $4.99? Plus uh, regular updates, treat it like an app with regular updates where like a month from now it adds the Twitter feature, you know, it, it keeps building as an app and then uh, the content keeps delivering and then you don't have all this like the fees of trying to generate the publicity, the app is already inside the machine. Yeah, uh, and, and I think that is, again, that was sort of part of our 2.0 thinking is that you would, we would release new songs and new video. And, but but I guess my my advice or or my response to that is to me, out of everything that that limited us limited us, in the end, it was the, I don't think the price was the major barrier. I don't even think size was the the leading barrier. I think one it was how the hell do people know about it? And so and so how do you? And I'm asking. I'm not having the answer. Like how do you outside of hitting that thing where it just goes, create an app on your own in your workshop, when and people are uploading. There's thousands of those things going up in the app store every day. How do you stand out in that market and how do you grow it? And then also, how do you go and you build, especially with a series? I think I come back to that idea of building a story around it. So, how do you go and um, keep people engaged from week to week? And ironically. I'm just sort of saying this now, it's, it's like we've become, <laughs> we, used to, we, used to, we used to have TV companies come to us and say, I want to keep people with my story until next Tuesday when you watch it. And uh, that's what we did and we did it successfully. But then we became the TV guys and sort of, I'm not saying forgot about that, but it's interesting just to, to see how that was sort of the missing element is, is we really approached it where in hindsight, you know, you think, I'm going to create this video content, I'm going to tell this story, but outside of just doing a, a release of a video once a week, why am I even, this is the thing, why am I going to come back to the app store, go into my app store thing, go to updates, press update, wait for, you know, these are the questions. What are the mechanisms to keep driving that audience and keep them engaged? Uh, as a ramble, but, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I'll some more later. Jay, thank you so much. And if anyone has questions, maybe you'll stick yeah. around and talk afterwards. Cool. Thank you. Okay, we're going to do, uh, we have one five by five tonight, and it's by uh, James Carter, uh, who has uh, been a member for a while. And uh, his project is called uh, New York Hearts, Lower East Side. Hello, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, I am very excited to uh, announce tonight my new project. It's called New York Hearts. And the reason I'm explaining it uh, tonight to you and announcing it is because uh, I've just been uh, accepted to the Gameplay Festival, which is out in Brooklyn. This is Gita Arbor. She's the uh, executive producer of the festival. And for those of you who don't know what uh, the Gameplay Festival is, I call it the theatrification of games. Uh, <laughs> so uh, basically what they do is they mash up uh, guitars and uh, Mortal Kombat and let uh, teenage boys play with Juliet in Romeo and Juliet uh, in World of Warcraft. And of course, uh, the big thing to come out of it last year was uh, Red Cloud Rising. Uh, Red Cloud Rising, some of you may know because uh, Gita presented it here at the forum once and uh, it got a lot of press in the New York Times. And it's a really fun thing that uh, she did in the lower uh, end of Manhattan in the financial district uh, in which it was sort of a scavenger hunt and a, a conspiracy theory and she had people coming up to you on the street in clues and it was, it was a fun game. And so I was really inspired by it and I started thinking about what I could do to uh, create more you know, live events and theater and um, happenings in New York neighborhoods because I've been here for a really long time and I, I love this city. Uh, so what I decided to do was uh, create a story, a, a love story, uh, that is going to be told in eight different parts and uh, five of those locations in the Lower East Side uh, are going to be small businesses. 
Now those small businesses are partnering with me and what I'm doing is I'm featuring them in the story and it's gonna be geotagged audio storytelling. So uh, the main character of uh, Jill is going to be telling uh, her story and the way it works is uh, Jill, a mixed media and tattoo artist, speaks to Sal on the anniversary of their first date. Over an audio storytelling app, she recalls how they met and fell in love in the Lower East Side of NYC, leading listeners like voyeurs to sexy moments and special spots. Relive what Jill saw, tasted, and felt as she reveals the truth about Sal's past. So that's what, that's what New York Hearts LES is about. Uh, what I've done so far is I've partnered with two lo um, small businesses on the LES, a yoga studio uh, called Yoga High, which is really awesome, and a really cool bar that has a speakeasy uh, called Bar Mundi. Now, what I've done is I've put out proposals to cafes, bakeries, and retail stores, uh, but I haven't nailed anything down yet. So if any of you live on the LES or any of you uh, know of any spots that you really like to frequent, please come up to me and let me know about it because I would really uh, like to nail this down in the next week or so, uh, which is possible. Uh, the other thing that uh, we're looking at doing is uh, featuring the other three locations in the eight parts uh, in parks and uh, like landmarks for people to really experience the Lower East Side. It's about the neighborhood. It's not necessarily just about these businesses. Uh, so like I said, the major temple of this is a geotagged audio storytelling uh, platform. And essentially what I want to do is have the app on uh, your phone so that when you go there, it's on the map and you can click on it and then you can listen to the story. Um, I'm looking for a platform. I have been talking to some different people who do this type of thing. I'm also looking for a developer. So if anybody is doing that or interested in that or knows somebody who's interested in getting involved with something from the ground up, um, I think it's going to be like some API work within some of these platforms. Uh, I am going to be using uh, Instagram and Tumblr because Jill is an artist and she's going to be showing tattoos and uh, visual art and cool things like that. Probably we'll be using Twilio to have Jill communicate with the participants as they go through the Lower East Side. And then uh, there's going to be some video content. And that video content uh, is going to be a small integration at this point, but the idea is that I want to expand it. Uh, we're launching it in July as part of the festival, but my aim is to get it going so that maybe we can run it into the fall. And in September, I want to um, go into other neighborhoods. So my intention is from now until this time next year to launch five different neighborhoods in New York City that are love stories all throughout, uh, which will, of course, have then introduced at least five characters that we'll take onto a web series in the fall of 2013. So what do I need? Uh, right now, I need an associate producer because I've been doing it all by myself. <laughs> uh, not quite all by myself. I've had some help and there's been some really great people coming for, through and my bu small business partners have been really helpful about like, getting doors open in other businesses down there. Uh, but I do need some help uh, with paperwork and whatnot. We're going to get a small budget and if you're interested. Also, also like I said, the developer, uh, the businesses, and of course, fundraising starts next week. So if anybody's interested in this and wants to like, give me some money, I'm totally happy to take it. Uh, but if you want to just know more about it, you can go to these spots online, and then in another week, I'll kickstart you, and you can maybe give a little bit then. So thank you very much for listening to my little uh, thing about this awesome project that I'm very, very excited about. And thanks to, um, I just want to shout out these guys, Ina and Mike and Rachel and Jen have all been, like, you don't understand that there's a hack happening this week. And this is like, it's on. There are teams here and we're going to fight afterwards and it's out there in the parking lot and you can come and watch. But on Sunday, we're going to be presenting. So come by. It's really, really exciting. They decided to continue do a hack and a forum in one week. They're nuts. So give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, James. Uh, we'll uh, tweet out and post uh, this information on Facebook as well. Thank you very much. Great five by five. It was in five minutes as well. So that was awesome. Awesome. A couple of quick announcements. Um, on May 8th, Tuesday, May 8th, we're going to have another tech immersion in the flex space. Uh, this one is going to be focused on uh, processes for developing these types of immersive tech and story apps. So um, I'll be leading the first half, kind of talking about um, tech, tech, kind of tech project processes, and then Mark Harris will be talking about 
kind of working with creative technologists and how to work with developers if you're kind of coming from it from more of a creative perspective. So it'll be very focused on process. Um, and we'll be announcing that tomorrow around lunchtime. Uh, they, they kind of fill up pretty quickly, so look for a meetup uh, email then. And then on May 22nd is our May forum. We've got a, a double booking that day, which is going to be really cool. We've got Jay Ferguson from guidestones.org uh, who will be presenting that project, which was a, another interesting way to uh, release a story uh, by email and just, just kind of a very interesting story there. Um, as well, we've got Peter Higgin from Punchdruck who will be talking about both Sleep No More, but also some work that they've been doing at the MIT Media Lab. Um, and they're going to be sharing with them the results of their work there. So that should be very exciting. So. I, I just want to give a shout out to the Film Society because they are our key partner both um, for all these events as well as for the Story Hackathon. Matt Bullish is in the back and he'll take the thanks. <laughs> We hope to see you, those of you who can, who are participating or who can come on Sunday, uh, on Sunday. And for those of you we'll see next time, uh, like Mike said, keep in mind, it will be a long meetup next time, so come prepare. But it's going to be fun. Everyone's super excited to see these two projects. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.